Gospel of John. We are continuing. We are getting closer to the end. We have been through much of the book. We are up to John chapter 17. And just by way of review, last week in chapter 16, we went through verses 16 through 33, and Jesus was talking to his disciples. Again, that Judas had already gone. He while Jesus is speaking these things and while these things are happening, Judas is assembling a group of people together or Judas is at least saying, hey, I know where Jesus is, for him to be arrested. So all this is going on. It's very timely. Things are coming to a head. And so Jesus takes that opportunity knowing that he's about to be arrested. He's about to be crucified. After he's crucified, he's going to be resurrected and he's going to ascend back to the Father. And so with his departure at hand, the, the events of his departure are, are at hand, he spends time counseling with his disciples and talking to them about things that they are going to need to know and things that they are going to need to hold on to because I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm going to go away. I'm going back to the Father. And he even tells them, you should rejoice that I'm going back to the Father. That should be something that you understand as a as being a good thing. But the fact that I'm leaving, I'm going to send a helper. And the helper is going to bring to mind all of the things that, I've, that you've learned, basically John 1 through John 15, all of these things that you have learned and you have seen in me, the helper is going to help you recall a lot of those things and help you understand a lot of those things. Last week we talked about figurative language and parables where he talked to them and he said, I've, I've spoken to you in figurative language, but now I'm going to speak plainly to you. In the context that we we're in last week, he said, I'm going to talk plainly now. And well, we kind of dove into figurative language and parables. Why did that happen? He says, because people with eyes that don't see, it's like a hidden meeting. If they don't, if they don't open their eyes to God, then they won't understand what I'm saying anyway. But if you open your eyes to God, I speak in a parable, and this is something that you can understand. So it's an idea of not only is it hidden from those that don't want any part of God, so to speak, but it's a way of revealing things to those that do, and it also reveals over time. God said, a lot of the things that I've taught you, you don't understand now, but you will. So a lot of the parables, the disciples are all of a sudden going to have this, oh, that's what that meant. Moments as time went on. So he used this technique of figurative language so that when he left, a lot of what he said that they didn't quite get, they would get as time went on. As circumstance would bring something into their life, they would then remember, that's what he was talking about. This is what we see. This is what's going on. So figurative language. But then he left them with joy, love, and peace. And he told them to have joy in your life, you're going to have to abide in God. Joy is the inner comfort, the inner confidence in the midst of trouble, in the midst of struggle in your life, tribulation. He was telling them, even in that, you can have joy. It is this inner confidence within the struggle. You can have joy in your life and know that even those have purpose. Even those are a part of my plan. So struggle and trouble and persecution, things like that, are all things that God uses so you can be joyful in that. And then he talked about love, where he talked about you will no longer be praying side by side anymore. You're going to go straight to the throne of God now. God is now making access to his throne where you're going to pray directly to the Father because the Father loves you. So here's Jesus on his way out saying, now you need to connect with the Father and understand you can pray to him anytime that you want because he loves you. He has accepted you. And then the last thing, you have joy, love, and then peace. And he says, my peace I give you. And again, it's that ability to have confidence because he says, I have overcome the world. So no matter what's going on, you can have peace. And that's chapter 16. So now we get to John chapter 17. After Jesus has done all these things and there's been this charted path of him with his disciples. Remember, we looked at some maps and Jesus 
Jesus didn't tour the Caribbean. Jesus didn't go to... He stayed in an area because he worked within that area with his disciples so that his disciples would then go out and reach the world when he leaves. <clears throat> so he invested in them. So today's objectives, what we're going to talk about is John chapter 17, but we're only going to talk, talk about verses 1 through 5. But as we look at the chapter, Jesus prays. Think about that for a second. This is a chapter where Jesus is praying. God the Son has a prayer life. And we've seen it all through John, but still it's amazing to think about that the Son is praying to the Father. This chapter can be divided up into thirds. First one is prayer for his mission and purpose. The second is prayer for the disciples. And then lastly, prayer for the generations to come. And that's what Jesus is praying for. What's kind of interesting is uh, we will see just the things that he prays for and the things that he prays about. It says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. We get the amazing opportunity to be invited in to a conversation between the Son and the Father. Nothing short of what's going on right now. This is an intimate moment with the Son and the Father about, I was sent to come and take on flesh to represent you, but I get to come home. I get to come back home. And so here's the Father and the Son uh, in this moment where Jesus is praying to the Father. This section of Scripture, John 17, has been called the high priestly prayer of Jesus where he's praying as a priest on behalf of the disciples and future generations. Or this has also been called truly the Lord's Prayer. Unlike in Matthew, where he says, when you pray, pray like this. And we call that the Lord's Prayer. This is truly the Lord's Prayer, praying to the Father. He didn't start this context by, hey, when you pray, pray like this. No, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and immediately started saying, Father. He was speaking to the Father himself. So this is, could be called the Lord's Prayer. Jesus states in 16, at the end of the chapter, 1633, he says, These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So he says that right at the end. And then we get into 17. Then he prays to the Father in their presence. Jesus didn't walk away. He wasn't like, hey, excuse me, I'm going to go uh, spend a little quality time. Right then and there, he says, I've overcome the world. I imagine there was probably a pause. And then with that, he started to pray right there in front of all of them. That kind of sets the stage for what's going on. So it says here, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. Not to read too much into this, but heaven, the Greek word there, uranos, means the visible heavens, the atmosphere, the sky, or the starry heavens. So when he's lifting up his eye, this is not some supernatural thing where he's looking into where God is sitting per se. This is literally the Greek word is, this is the atmosphere. If you and I were to lift up our eyes and we would look into the heavens, that's what we would see. Deuteronomy 10.14 says, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. So the Bible talks about different heavens. When he says that he looked up and he looked into heaven or he lifted up his eyes towards heaven, there is the opportunity to look at different heavens. We have the earth's atmosphere. We have the starry sky and things like that. And then we have the abode of God, or as we like to say, heaven where, where God lives. 
2 Corinthians 12, 2 says, I know a man in Christ who for 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows such a one was caught up to third heaven. So again, as we're reading this in John, this is just to point out when it says that, his body, that he raised his head up and he looked toward heaven, there are different heavens, but the one that he looked up, this is all just to say right there in his pre the presence of the disciples, he looked up. Uh, it wasn't anything more supernatural than that. Where are we anyway? In John 14, 31, we have out there, and I kind of made light of this statement, but 14.31 says, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. And I jokingly said, I wish we all talk like that more often, you know, instead of being with your buddies and going, Hey, you guys want to head out or anything like No, I wish we would still say things like, Arise, let us go from here. I think it makes us sound more intelligent. But he says, arise, let us go from here. Where were they? Well, they were at the Last Supper, so they were in the upper room. Where is the upper room? Good question. When you find out, let me know. In this drawing, we have the upper room here, as far as the city. Here's the temple. And, but I have heard people say that it was in the upper city area. It was maybe in the middle of the city. We don't know. The upper room was where the upper room was. That's where It was where they were. All that to say we don't know. But from wherever it was on this diagram that I found on the internet, it's got to be true. You can't lie on the internet, right? So from here, they started walking. Arise, let us go from here. Where were they going? To the Garden of Gethsemane, which is over here. So as they're walking through the city, that's where we're at. They're making their way to the garden. And so that's where we're at in context. Mark 14, starting in verse 32 says, Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, why are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came to the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude of swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and scribes and the elders." All of this is happening. None of this is in John. So on this journey, we have in, ver in chapter 18 where Jesus is arrested. So this prayer that he is praying to the Father, I believe, is before he gets to the garden and what happens in Mark happens. So this prayer, I believe, is before he goes to the garden or makes it to the garden, whereas and eventually back to John in chapter 18... Starting in verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook of Kidron. So this is Kidron right here, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. This is where Mark would kind of pick up that story. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Here we have the in-betweener stuff, right, where we are fortunate to have the whole scripture. and We can look at put things in pieces because it's in one gospel, but maybe not the other. But this is kind of where we're at. I'm a visual guy. I like to know where I'm at. If I don't know where I'm at, I feel like I'm in danger. I feel like everybody's going to attack me and I won't know where to go. Back to John 17. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. The hour is this appointed time, right, where he came. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And the time had come for that to happen. So, when he says glorify your son, glorify 
literally is talking about vindicate the truth of his teaching and his identity through the fulfillment of the mission. Glorify your son in all that I've said and all that I've done and all the preparation. You do your will through me. Glorify me. And remember the word glorify. We throw that around and sometimes we miss kind of what the word glorify means. But it has everything to do with who you are and what you do. You get glory by being who you are uh, when it comes to truth and doing the right thing and, and your actions. So to glorify, glorify me is the things that I'm doing, I'm going to receive glory for. Christ receives glory in the fact that he's our Savior. His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, all of these things bring glory to him. Verse 2, as you have given him, the Son, authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Authority given to Christ. Let's talk about a few different things. Psalm chapter 2, why do the, nation, the nations rage and why do the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That would be Christ saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. At the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled. But a little, blessed are those who put their trust in him. So this authority is going to be given to Christ to rule the nations. John 5, 27 says, And he and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Another thing given to the Son is the, the authority to execute judgment. And then lastly, John 10, 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down, talking about his life. And I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So the Father has granted him Authority to rule the nations, authority to judge, and the authority for the power over life. I can lay my life down and I can pick it up again. So when John 17, 2 is talking about, as you have given the Son authority over all flesh, this is what we're talking about. Different parts of Scripture we can see where this authority has been given to Christ. Also in verse 2, as you have given him the Son authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Uh-oh. Now we're in this territory of, I sure hope God the Father gave me to Christ and didn't choose to not give me to Christ. Now we're in this realm of, you know, what's commonly taught as Calvinism. Did the Father choose certain ones? Well, let's go back and remember some things that are still in the Bible. John 3, 15 and 16, that whoever, okay, you see the word whoever? That literally means whoever. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This isn't the chosen ones. This isn't, this isn't you were chosen by God to believe, but it was you believed, therefore you are the chosen of God. Look at chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. John eleven twenty six. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And then lastly, twelve forty six. 
I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. We have a lot of whoever's. Old English, you know, whosoever. So who are the ones that the Father has given this to the Son? Those that have chosen to believe. The whoever's that have chosen to believe in Christ are given to the Son. He is the first fruits of all those that are coming to Him. So don't mistake the, uh-oh, the Father gave the Son certain people. Who did He give them? The ones that chose to believe. Because we know that because we cross-reference Scripture. And we know that Scripture interprets Scripture, right? So we have this idea that all through the book, we have the whoever comes to me, whoever comes to me. He meets a lady at a well and goes, hey, this is going to make you thirsty again. But if you come to me, you will never thirst again. He gives her that option. And then she's a part of the whoever. And then what does she do? She runs to town and she says, hey, I, I met a man. He told me everything about myself. And, and then all these people in the town came to know the Lord. They were part of the whoever. All that came from that story, right? So don't get hung up on this. That Uh-oh. Am I one that the Father gave to the Son? I don't know. Am I saved? Well, are you the whoever? Did you whoever believe? Then you're the whoever that were given to the Son. Using Scripture to interpret Scripture. Verse 3, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I put it in all caps so I'm yelling at you. You ever get a message from somebody and it's like in all caps and you actually lean back a little bit because you're like, whoa, all caps. Eternal life is not a place. Eternal life is not an escape from judgment. Eternal life is not a fulfillment of our deepest desire. You know, eternal life with God, it's what everything that you want it to be. No, not, not really that either. And eternal life is not defined as walking to a mysterious light. What is it? Eternal life is knowing God. Plain and simple, this is a really good verse that clearly defines what eternal life is. Eternal life is the good place over the bad place. No, eternal life is knowing God. It's being where God is. And that is a, key, a very key distinction because we live in a flaky world, right? We say flaky things, you know? Hey, would you like to not go to hell? Okay, well, con contemplate another option, you know? No, nope, eternal life is knowing God. You've got to come to a place where you put your faith in God to get there. And so, this is eternal life, that they may know you, and that they know Jesus Christ, whom you sent. This is eternal life. I think it makes a difference as we live to understand where we are going is to a forever life with God, not heaven, per se. We're going there, but it's where he is. The font has gotten smaller. Good luck. 2 Timothy 1.12 I know whom I have believed, is what Paul tells Timothy. I know whom I have believed. He didn't say, I know what I have believed, but I know who I have believed. Eternal life is about a person. It is about God. The triumphant Christian experience Let's go back to John 6 and look at these verses. Knowing God, this is our Christian life. This is our outlook, our vision, our mission, our, the answer to the questions. All these things can be answered here. Our earthly realities of our eternal life with God. John 6, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life that flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Knowledge of truth, enlightenment, life with God, eternal life and knowing God brings knowledge of truth. The words that I speak are truth. They are life. John 17, 11 and 12. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them through your name, those who you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. 
What does knowing God bring to your life? The knowledge of security. To know that you're secure. God, I have kept the ones that you gave me. I'm holding on to them. They are absolutely secure. What is our earthly experience? What does our Christian life entail? It entails the knowledge of security that we have in Christ. 17, 13. But now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. What do we have? The knowledge of perspective, joy in life in spite of what's going on around us. We have joy. This is our Christian experience. Why? Because we know him. This is eternal life. It's knowing God. Knowing God now gives us these privileges now, even before we go home. John 17, 18. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. What does it bring? It brings a knowledge of purpose. Knowing God gives you purpose for life. Do you know anybody that needs this in their life? I mean, are there people in the world that need to feel secure or need to know what's true and need to have perspective to trials in life or maybe would like to have a purpose in life? I know a couple. I meet them every day at work, right? I see everybody on their worst day, every day, all day. We go to people on their worst day and they have none of this. And you can see it. You can, it's written all over their lives and all over their families and all over their experiences. How about satisfaction? John 17, 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Sanctification, knowledge of our position in Christ. We are set apart. We're not like the world. We're not part of it. We're actually set apart from the world. God has taken our driver's license and scratched out 601 South Elder Avenue and he put heaven don't say that to a police officer. It's a good way to get a ticket because you're being a smart aleck. You know, where do you live? Heaven. Get out of the car. Um, so don't try that, but our home is now heaven. We're set apart. We don't live here. This isn't our home. This isn't our place. We don't do what the people here do because it's not, this isn't our place. We don't do the things that you do. Why? Because my, my home is in heaven. I'm different. I'm set apart now. I've got, a, I've got a place where I'm going to go eventually, and I want, I want my entry into that place to be just rewards galore. That's what I'm working for. I'm, I'm, I'm on a mission field right here. This isn't my place. I'm set apart now from the world and the troubles. Why? Because I have true security, perspective, purpose, position. What about unity? 1722. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. How about relationships and unity, knowledge of common life? Wouldn't it be nice to be around a group of people that all understand and have these things and want to pour that into you? How amazing is that? Something terrible happened. Okay, that means it happened to me too. Giddy up. Let's go through it together. What a difference it makes. And knowing God, this is eternal life. But we have earthly realities of it first. We have knowledge of common life. And then lastly, fellowship. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Isn't that amazing? Jesus wants you to be with him. I want them to be where I am. That they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. How about a knowledge of our eternal destiny? Our eternal destiny is with God. What happens when you die? I don't know. I've heard people say you, you run to the light, or I've heard people say that this, that, and the other. No. When you go, you go, and your eternal destiny is you are with Christ. A lot of times when people say those things, I've died, or I know somebody that's died, or I'm, I'm a little hesitant because, man, was Jesus there? Then you weren't absent from the body. Because absent from the body is present with the Lord according to the Bible. Maybe you weren't gone yet. Maybe you were seeing things in your brain, yeah, but heaven, I don't think you were there yet. Because the Bible very plainly says that, but we will have fellowship with God. We will have fellowship with Him. So, all of this to say eternal life, what is it? It's knowing God. Well, what does that do? Good question. It gives me a knowledge of truth, security, perspective, purpose, position, common life, and my eternal destiny. 
know God. Do you know anybody that needs this? Like, would somebody have a better day if they woke up every day with that? I mean, maybe we should make cheat sheets. In my police car, I have cheat sheets. All of our 10 codes, we change those around or we don't use them forever. And you hear, we have a 10 code for this person may have a blood-borne pathogen. And somebody throws out that 10 code. Well, we don't use, you use that maybe once in your whole career. Somebody throws that out and I grab my cheat sheet. What is that one? Oh, okay, this person has a blood He's got something in his blood that I don't want, you know. Maybe we should make cheat sheets and put that on our mirror in the morning. Every day when we wake up, this is my eternal life. This is what I have. This is what knowing God has brought to my life. And I'm experiencing it here on earth. But then my eternal reality is going to be to know him without sin around me, without in a foreign land. I will be home. I will live in his house. Knowing God, Paul told Timothy, I know whom I have believed. Verses 4 and 5, John 17, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which, I had, which you have given me to do. Look at Philippians 2.8. It says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. I have glorified you on earth. You gave me a mission, and I have humbled myself within that mission. Humbled myself even to the point of death, even the death of the cross, which was gruesome. Humbled himself to such degree that's where we're at. Okay, back to John. The Father gave the Son five things in John chapter 17. 17.4 17, gave him work. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given to me. John 17, 2, 6, 9, 24 is believers. We read that earlier, right? Give eternal life to as many you have given me. So believers are given to Christ. 17.5, he has given glory. O oh, now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you. Then he was given words to say, for I have given to them the words which you have given me. And then a name, 17, 11, and 12. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. God the Father has given God the Son a name. All these things were given to the Son. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before I was with you. Jesus came from glory to reveal the glory of the Father and was looking forward to his return to glory. A lot of glory going on. Let's get into the Greek language. And everybody said, Amen. Here we have some pretty neat little language stuff going on. Ego se edaxasa epi tes geis. What does that do for you? Nothing. But literally, what that means is, I, you, glorified on earth. In verse 5, we have the phrase, and I won't read it in Greek, glorify me, you. Father with yourself. We have a neat little emphasis going on where they are put together, the I and the you or the me and the you in the Greek language. And what Christ is literally saying here is, I glorified you on earth, glorify me in heaven. But in English, that's, that would be the literal translation would be, I you glorified on earth. And then glorify me you, Father with yourself or in heaven. Kind of a neat little language thing going on here in verses 4 and 5. The eternal supremacy of Christ, glorify, doxasan, is an aorist active imperative. What does that mean to you? Nothing, but let me explain it. Christ is literally saying to God the Father, he's commanding him with something that expects to be followed. That is what's brought out in the Greek text. So when Christ says to the Father, glorify me, 
That is a literal command that is expected to be followed. Who is Christ? Part of the Godhead. Part of the Godhead where he gives the Father a command, not in a, hey, you better do this way, but gives him a command that he knows is going to be followed because of that unity amongst the Godhead. So what does he say? He says, glorify me because I know you will. Because we are together. We think the same. We want the same. Glorify me. It's a command that expects to be followed. The supremacy of Christ. Who is he? He's the kind of person that can command God in, in heaven to do something and expect it to be followed. The supremacy of Christ. Number two, glorify me with the glory which I had with you. Look at Isaiah 42.8. Isaiah 42.8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. That's pretty clear, right? My glory I will not give to another. What is Jesus doing in the New Testament? Glorify me, giving him a command. Who is Christ? He is the supreme God. The supremacy of Christ. We see in number two when he says, glorify me, God had already said in the Old Testament, I'll never do that to anybody but me, but God. So Christ, being a part of the Godhead, receives glory because he is God. And then lastly, before the world was, look at John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Skip down to 14. And the Word became flesh, and we and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Remember the glory that doesn't go to anybody else. But we beheld His. Who? Jesus. We beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, the supremacy of Christ. Glorify me, Aaron. When he, this intimate moment that he's having with the Father, where he tells the Father, I, you, glorified on earth, you glorify me in heaven. We get a little look into the supremacy, the deity of Christ, even in the conversation that he has with the Father. So let's summarize. Just like that, we're wrapping up. Jesus knew his time was at hand. He prayed to the Father as he looked ahead to the glory he and the Father would receive. Because of all of these things, it just brings more glory to God the Father and God the Son. And again, going back to that word glory, part of the definition, which it's not complicated, but the definition is broad of the word glory. Glory, as part of the definition has the idea of weights. Think of weights. If I were to go upstairs and I've got a weight bench up there and I were to grab the bar and I were to take the bar off and I was going to bench press the bar and I struggle to get the bar up and you think, huh, I actually thought he was a little stronger than that. You know, and it doesn't bring me a whole lot of glory. But then when I go up there and I take two 45-pound plates on each side of the bar, and now we're talking 225 pounds, and I take that off, and man, I bring that down, and, and you have an idea of what 225 pounds feels like. Now you go, hmm, that's pretty good. That brings glory because it's weighty. And so when we glorify God or we bring Him glory, it's the weightiness of all of who he is. It's the weightiness and all of what he's doing and what he's done. We throw all that on there and we bring him glory by saying, you know, God, I bring you glory because of who you are and because of what you've done in my life. You've redeemed me. You've, you've sent your son. And, and it's like we're throwing those big plates on that bar and we're going, God can handle all this weight. It's more and more and more glory. That's what glory is. He prayed to the Father as he looked ahead to the glory he and the Father would receive from all that he's done. He receives glory by all of this. Number two, Jesus has been given authority to be the life giver to all those who come to him. Number three, eternal life is knowing the eternal God. Eternal life is not, hey man, would you like to go to a good place when you die? How, about, how would you like to know God? Well, what does that mean? Let me go back to that slide. It means some pretty cool stuff. 
It gives you your, your whole direction and meaning of life. Knowing Him, that is eternal life. Number four, Jesus and the Father are in perfect union in all things. Glorify me. It was a command knowing it was going to be done. We're in unity. That's like if I, if I tell Kai, there's a man running at us with a knife, and I say, Kai, defend me. Well, I know he's going to do that because I know Kai. I know him. I know what his actions would be. It would be a bad day for that guy. Okay? I know those things. So the command is not, hey, you better listen to what I say, but it's commanding in something that I know that you already want to do. It's already who you are. They're in perfect union in all things. And Jesus is equal to the Father in glory. That's where we're at. We're in this prayer where Jesus is talking to the Father. I can only imagine being a disciple there when he says, I have overcome the world. And then he just looks up and he goes, Father, you know, it's almost like, should we stay? Should we leave? You know, you have this going on right in front of you. And this is all the stuff to know God, to, to understand the glory of God that comes from what he's about to do. All of these things were right there in front of the disciples to see and to witness this interaction. Next week, we're going to get into him praying for his disciples. They've got a big job to do. They are going to be apostles. Apostles are one chosen for a specific mission. An apostle is somebody who was chosen by Christ himself to go out and to do something and to do miracles and all of this because they're going to set up the church. They're going to set up a new era, a new economy. Why? Because Jesus had been rejected by his own. He wanted to come in and set up the kingdom. He said, the kingdom's at hand because the king is here. It's here. I'm here. And they go, not interested. So the Bible, not to go too deep into that, says that now the kingdom is postponed. And now he brings in the church era where he goes, the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit indwells believers, and you have this idea of the church. And then eventually the kingdom will come in the future where he will set it up. And, but the glory of Christ and all in who he is, all in what he's doing, should give us hope, joy, love, peace in our lives. Hopefully the disciples, right, were listening to all that going, hmm, all right. I feel like I'm working out here. I feel like I'm getting prepared for something that's about to happen. Hopefully, us too. We hear all that and we see all that and we believe all that so that our actions then are a reflection of that. We change our lives. Things aren't the same anymore. We're not in Kansas anymore, right? I'm going to wake up different. What I think about first thing is going to be different. Where I go is going to be different now. Who I visit is going to be different now. What I say is going to be different. What I allow to be said to me, it's going to be different. All of that, it's what he's pouring into the disciples. Life is now different. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word. We thank you that we get to study it and read it. Father, it is a glimpse into who you are, and we may never see really your true glory until we get to heaven, but we can read about it. We can read about it, we can digest it, and we can make it a, a part of who we are here on earth. Father, you give us that security and that purpose and knowledge of the truth. You give us so much just by knowing you. Father, may we live our lives each and every day in such a way that we honor you with that love that you've given us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.